My goodness, that was something, amen? Wow, are you glad you came today? Amen, and I know that you at home are glad that you joined in with us. Hey, it's time for our kindergarten first and second graders to go to children's church again. So if you're ready and you want to go, kids, go ahead and head on out. Miss Carrie is back there in the back waiting on you, and uh, they'll, you'll have a great time there, and we'll see you uh, just in a little bit when you get back. The third Advent Sunday, joy, the third candle that we lit today is to get the idea of, some, of the joy that we're supposed to have even in bad weather like today, amen? We can still have joy. I was joking with somebody a while ago and said, this is the kind of snow that my wife and I both get what we want. She likes it to snow and I don't like it on the ground, so snow that, hit, that comes down and melts once it hits the ground... We're both happy, amen? Now, one thing that I know is uh, it is always good. I love Northeast Oklahoma, but I got some pictures today from my brothers. Boy, it's good to be in Southwest Oklahoma today. Man, they're getting inches and inches of snow up there. So to all of you that may be watching from up there, I'm sorry, amen? But boy, God is an amazing God, amen? And we can find joy in all of our lives. We can find joy that God desires for us to have, and it will transform us. As a matter of fact, you know, Christmas is supposed to be a season of joy, amen? That's what it is. It's a season of joy, and we sing joy to the world, and we have all of this wonderful stuff going on. And unfortunately, so many people either find no joy in this season, or they find joy in it, but as soon as it's over, it's gone. As a matter of fact, what usually happens to folks who find it right now and it's gone is it usually leads and is replaced with depression and sadness or even anxiety over everything that just transpired this is not what God desires for us to have the joy that we're looking at that we, we that we're going to be talking about today the joy that God desires for us to have is not a temporary conditional joy it's the joy that we have in our lives to stay that way I want you to look in the book of Romans chapter 15. And in Romans chapter 15, uh, Jerry just read that a few moments ago, so we're not going to stand in reading of it, but it's gen uh, in Romans 15, 13, Paul is making a prayer here for the church at Rome. And I believe it's a prayer that we should be having for each other here today. It's a prayer that I want to pray over you. It's a prayer that we should be praying for each other. It's a prayer that we should be praying over the world that they would be able to understand what this joy is. And Paul prays here. He says, now may God, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of of the Holy Spirit. Now, in this prayer, in this statement, there's there's a lot there, and I, I want to, if you will, unpack it for you just a little bit. Look at some certain aspects of this scripture, because what happens again is that we don't understand joy, and the reason joy comes and goes and bring is then replaced with so much other anxieties is that we don't understand joy and how it is that we get it, and how it is that we keep it. This divine joy. And that's what we're looking at today is, again, not just joy, but a divine joy. Guys, it's not working back there, so see if we can skip it around. But anyway, it's the divine joy. Now, as I shared with you, there's a difference between each one of these. And every time I bring it up, I want to, <clears throat> I want to mention to you that this is divine. It's not man-made. It's, it's, it's all from God, which makes it special, makes it lasting, and makes it very effective. And so the idea today with this divine joy is the fact that we see there's two types of joy or two views of joy, if you, if you will. The first one that I want to look at is basically from the dictionary, and it's the Merriam-Webster dictionary, and it's the, listen to this idea of joy. And this is what I think a lot of the world, and sometimes even we in the church, will try to determine this is the joy we look at. And what he, the Merriam-Webster says this, the emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. Now, if you, if you look at this idea, this is the why that I believe the joy that a lot of people feel at Christmas time is eventually replaced by January with the idea of anxiety and depression and sadness. Because all of this is circumstantial emotion. It's when the circumstances are right... I can have the joy. 
And it says it's the emotion evoked by well-being. When things are good, when I feel good and my family feels well, then we can have joy. When we're successful, when the things that I want to do, the things that I want to achieve, when we gain success, then I can feel joy. When I have good fortune, man, when, when things are going our way, it's easy to have that joy, amen? And then all of a sudden it says not only that, but by the prospect of possessing what one desires. The idea that out there tomorrow I could have great success in what I'm doing, great achievement. Now the problem with this is, this is all again circumstantial emotion. That if things are good, I can have joy. That's the definition that the world lives by. And that's the definition that, unfortunately, even some of us in the church live by this type of joy. As long as things are good. But I want to look at a second view of joy. The second uh, second view of joy is is found, and John Piper made this, uh, I found this, and I, I think it's such a good definition, a good idea of what divine joy is. And he says, A divine joy, a good feeling in the soul. A good feeling in the soul that's produced by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that lives in us is the one that will produce this joy. It's not circumstantial, but that it's produced by the Holy Spirit, causing us to see the beauty of Christ in His Word and the beauty of Christ in His Word. And so everything that we see here is in this definition has nothing to do with outside forces, has nothing to do with success or failure, has nothing to do with riches or poorness. It has nothing to do with any of those. It happens to be inside of each one of us, and it's not produced by us or by what we do. It's produced by the Holy Spirit. That's the peace and joy that God wants us to have. When Paul prayed this, he even said... That it that may bound in you in the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So this joy, this divine joy, has nothing to do with outside stuff, but uh, everything that works inside of us. So a couple things I want to look at as we as we dissect this this text right here. The first one is divine joy is given through salvation. That apart from being saved, there is no divine joy because we need to understand this, my friends. Joy and salvation go together. Joy and salvation go together. You can't have one without the other. They go, they have to be together. As a matter of fact, let's look in the book of Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Listen to what the angel said. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, before, before behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now I want you to look at three words here that go together in what the angels declared. Great joy and a Savior. They said, behold, we bring to you good news of great joy, not because you are now seeing the angels and the heavenly hosts. That's not what brought them joy. It's not that they saw a star that was out there. It's not because they saw any other thing brought by the angels, the star, or even the season. It's not, behold, it's a Christmas season. It's a good season for you. So now we bring you good news of great joy. He said, we bring you good news of great joy only because there is a Savior being born. So even the angels declared there is no joy Apart from salvation, it doesn't work that way. So he says, there's great news coming that we're giving you today because of the, because of the joy that the Savior brings. As a matter of fact, even David, in his relationship, you remember in the Old Testament, the King David was going along pretty well. And then he had an episode in his life where he saw a woman in the name of Bathsheba. And, and we know the story there, how he committed adultery and she became pregnant. He even was led to even murder her husband to cover it all up. And you'll remember that when uh, the, 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 the prophet came and Nathan, the prophet came and told him, said, David, this is what you've done in your life. David's heart was broken and, and, and he, was, he was eaten up by the sin in his life. And when he finally came to a point that he called out to God, you'll remember that he said in Psalm, in the book of Psalms, God restored to me 
the joy of what? Of your salvation. The joy of my redemption, the joy of your gift, the joy of salvation that you brought me. So David said, God, apart from your salvation, there is no joy in my life. Restore this back to me. Because again, my friends, I want to reiterate, joy and salvation go together. And joy and salvation go together. And according to Paul here in this text, that it is a work by, brought on by the Holy Spirit. It's the result of, if you will. He said, it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that works in you that will bring about this joy that will allow us to continue on. So in other words, if there's no Holy Spirit, there is no joy. And if there is no joy, there's no Holy Spirit. So they, they again, come together because there's no salvation. And you can't have the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you this? You cannot achieve the Holy Spirit apart from being saved. There's a lot of people who try to want the Holy Spirit working in them. They want to do whatever they can to get that Spirit inside of them. Oh, if I could just be that that way. But yet they refuse to turn their lives over to Christ. There is no Holy Spirit without salvation. But also, there is no salvation apart from the Holy Spirit. Because when I received Jesus into my life, listen to me, when I received Jesus Christ into my life, I received the Holy Spirit. I get how much of the Holy Spirit? All of it. I get all of it in me, and it's working in me. And so we see then that this idea of joy is produced not by myself, not by anything else except through the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in Galatians 5.22, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. These are the three of the things that we were, we're talking about. But joy has come by the fruit of the Spirit. It's, it's the product of the Holy Spirit working us. Then it goes on and says, of course, there's kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So we want joy. We desire joy that lasts. We desire joy that, that, that won't give up when it, times get tough or when the Christmas season is over. It is then workings of the Holy Spirit in us. Because by the power of the Holy Spirit, listen... We understand that it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this power, first of all, is the power that created the universe. This is why we can find true joy and divine joy. Because that same power of the Holy Spirit that created the universe is now in us. Amen? We have it here. Listen, my friends, that's why we can have joy. Because that same power is there in us. But not only the power of the, that created the universe, but the power that, of the resurrection. It's in us through the Holy Spirit. We have the power of the resurrection. Amen? That's why we don't have to fear <clears throat> even the greatest enemy of mankind, which is death. We do not have to fear death. Jesus said, you believe in God, you believe also me. Don't let your heart be troubled. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also, that you don't even have to fear death. He has overcome death. He has overcome everything. And that same power, my friend, is working in each one of us who has faith in Jesus Christ. But not only that, but it's the power that that opens up the, the, the idea of the mind to the truth. It allows us to understand the Word. And that is, if we go into this Word without the power of the Holy Spirit, we don't have any understanding of this. But it's when we get the power of the Holy Spirit and we apply it into the Word, this Word will begin to make sense to us. Now here's the thing about this Word here making sense to us. If this word here makes sense to us, the world will make less sense to us. We won't understand the things of this world. It will absolutely sound crazy when I'm beginning to be opened in my mind and my heart to the revelation of the Holy Spirit of God's word in me that then the world won't make sense. But then here's why then the world can't make sense of this. That's why the world doesn't understand the church. They don't understand what we're doing. They don't understand why we stand for what we stand for. Do the things that we do. Claim the things that we claim. It makes no sense to them. Because the Spirit, they do not have salvation, which means they do not have the Holy Spirit, which means they don't have the revelation of the truth. But when we have it, my friends, that's the Spirit. But not only that Spirit, but it's also the the power that seals every believer. 
I don't have to sit and worry about my salvation, amen? My salvation is sure, amen? Listen, can I tell you that once you receive Jesus into your heart, once you receive Jesus into your life, and you receive him by believing, and you call out his name, and you call upon his name to be saved, listen, you do not have to sit from this point on worrying, oh, when is it going to be too much? As I shared with you before, I, if it were left up to me, could lose a salvation. As I shared with you before, folks, I can't even keep up with my keys. Amen? All my staff will say amen. I get locked out of this church. I get locked out of my office all the time. I can't keep up with my keys. So how in the world could I keep up with salvation? But praise God, I don't have to keep up with it. He does. And it is that power, listen, it is that power that seals us unto the day of redemption the Apostle Paul talked about. It is that power that I know whom I believe, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against the day of judgment. I don't have to worry about it. So folks, listen, I can have joy because I know that I am saved and I'm going to continue to be saved. Because again, this joy is not by outside forces, but by the Spirit working in us. And then the second point I want to look in this text is divine joy is upheld by believing. It's upheld by believing. Paul says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. What's this idea, the joy is upheld by believing? What does that mean? Well, basically what it's saying is that we look to him, we look to him alone, only him, not anything else, not anything the world can give us, not anything that I can achieve on my own, but I look to the world, I, I look to him alone to fulfill all the promises that he's given me. That's what believing is, is to believe that he's never going to fail me, that he's never going to let me down, that every promise he made in his scripture, every promise that he claimed is absolutely going to be true. Because here's what I found out, my friend, he is trustworthy at all times amen he's trustworthy at all times not just when things are good not just when i'm happy not when things are, are just going the way i want them to go but he is trustworthy at all times listen to the book of hebrews chapter 11 verse 35 i want you to just mark this down that it's again it's not dictated by circumstances i want you to mark this text down that's what it says is Women received their dead and raised to life again. This is the result of God working in them, their faith. He said, others, though, were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. He goes on and says, still others had a trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, were slain without the, with the sword, uh, they wandered about in sheepskin and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, to whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in, in the deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. Now what it's talking about here is these are the people who were what we would call the heroes of the faith. These are the ones who stood strong. And listen, some things went well for some of them. Some things went well, it said here. But then look what it said about the others. Man, some were tortured. Some were even sawn in half. Some were destitute. Some were this. Listen, this will blow the idea of faith prosperity message right out of the water. Amen? Because not everything is going to go hunky-dory. But listen to me. They said that even in this time, God was faithful to them. Christ is faithful to us even when it happens to be good and when it happens to be not so good. Because we need to understand it's not dictated by our circumstances. If it were, we would be living in the most miserable time right now. Not in the history of the world, though. None of us are having this done to us, are we? But we see that he is trustworthy at all times. But not only can I be upheld in believing that he's trustworthy and knowing that he's trustworthy at all times, but can I tell you this? His promises never fail us. They never fail us. Not once has anything he's told me failed. The Bible tells us again in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 23. It says, Therefore, brethren, 
having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from the evil conscience of our bodies, washed with pure water, let us hold fast, listen, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, listen, oh, here's good, for he who promised is faithful. He who promised is absolutely faithful. Even when we're not. Even when we're not. He is faithful. He has promised us. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now can I ask you, what does never mean? Never. He didn't put stipulations on never, did he? He said, I won't ever leave you except. I won't leave you unless. He says, I will never under any circumstance, any situation, under anything that you could possibly do, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Leaving means to walk away from. Forsaking means never willing to come back. And he says, I will never do that to you. My friends, listen to me. That ought to bring joy to us during Christmas. Amen? That ought to bring joy to us even when New Year's rings in. It'll bring joy to us and even in February. It'll be in December of next year. We could still be having joy if we have joy that's brought by the faith and the power and the workings of the Holy Spirit in us. So if you're here today and you need that joy in your life or if you're watching us on the the live stream and you need joy today in your heart, can I tell you it is not found in anything you can do. It's not found in anything you can buy. It's not found in anything you can work for. It is found by the Holy Spirit working in your life through Jesus Christ when you receive him into your heart. That's when joy goes. And can I tell you then that many of us who go through our lives knowing that we're saved, but we get distracted by other things and we begin to look for those circumstantial elements of joy and then we wonder, where is that joy? Why is that joy not here any longer? It's because I've begun to look at other places and the power of the Holy Spirit is not alive and well in me. Oh, I have the Spirit. But the Bible says be careful not to quench that Spirit. It doesn't say be careful not to lose the Spirit or to throw out out the spirit it says be careful not to quench the spirit hold it down in check and not let it go boldly into my life and i begin to search other things and that holy spirit is there but it's not able to work because i'm refusing to let it be freed up the bible says be filled with the spirit and filled with the spirit means letting it go letting it be evident in our lives let it be working and manifesting itself that produces in me the joy that all of us so long for in our lives it's here But it's made by the Holy Spirit working. Not by me working. Not by you working. Not by any of you at home working. But by the Spirit of God being allowed to be free in us. So if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I know I'm saved, but I'm not experiencing joy. Can I tell you, according to what Paul's prayer was, that you are not having the faith and believing of all the promises of Christ, you've begun to hang on to something else. And that Holy Spirit is still there, but it's not able to be manifested in your life. Today, it is just the day that you say, Lord, restore back to me the joy, the joy that your salvation brought me. Restore it back. Man, can you imagine what it's going to be like in a church that has full of joy? Boy, the Holy Spirit moving. Woo! Man, could we see that today? Could we experience that today? And then come January 1st, can we still be having it? It's possible. So here today, as I I ask you to bow your head, I ask the praise team to come on back up and We're going to enter into, man, after this, we're going to enter into another time of praise and worship. But as we're here, if you're here today and or you're watching this morning and and you, you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want to encourage you today. Call upon his name. Seek forgiveness. 
claim him. The Bible is very clear what it says. That if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. And it goes on, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. That whosoever means anybody that's willing. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not maybe, not if you work hard, but shall be saved. So today, if you're here or you're at home and you don't know that joy, you don't know that divine joy, my friend, it is available to you today through Jesus Christ. Would you call on his name this morning? But Maybe you're here as a Christian. You say, man, I, I, I don't have that joy. I had it once, man. I remember Oh, but today I'd love to have that joy restored back to me. Then all you have to do is cry out as David did. God, forgive me and restore back to me the joy that I can go through this season. I can go through next year. I can go through life no matter what is going on around me. But by the true definition of joy, an emotion, a feeling in our spirit from the Holy Spirit that recognizes and reveals to us the the loveliness of Christ and his work in us. Wow. Would you call on that today? I'll be down front ready to to pray with you if you need to. If you're at home, call us here at the church. Man, we'll be glad to pray with you. That's what we want to know, that everybody today is experiencing joy. Joy. Father, hear us today. Speak to us today. Change our hearts today, Lord. And I pray Paul's prayer that everyone here would be full of joy and peace that's brought on by the workings of the Holy Spirit being freed up in their lives. Thank you for your love and thank you for these next few moments. Receive our praise and and worship again. Receive it now, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Church, would you stand?